Hey, good evening, everyone. David McGuffin here. It is August the 17th, 2021, and welcome to Travel Talk Tuesday. Thank you guys for joining. Uh, we're here in Florida, and there's a couple of hurricanes coming up through the Gulf of Mexico, not affecting us here in Jacksonville, and I think the hurricanes are pretty light as well. So uh, we had a, a bit of storms and whatnot today, but that's about it. I've enjoyed today. I spent about uh, five or six hours putting together our program for tonight, and uh, it's uh, still continuing with, with Rome, just like I had done uh, last, last week. And uh, last week, we talked about the Vatican and the neighborhood of Trastevere. And so this week, we're going to talk about classical Rome, which is the Roman Empire Rome, and we're also going to talk about uh, some of the Baroque city center of Rome, the historic city center. So I hope you'll enjoy what I prepared. Like I said, I had a great time putting it together. But uh, before I even run any video or anything else, I wanted to share with you a little recipe I have for uh, a drink that I love to drink in Italy. And uh, it's called a spritz, S-P-R-I-T-Z. And it's made with uh, two, two, two pieces of, um, you can either use Aperol, which is a, a liqueur that was developed in Milan in the late 1800s or so. And so you can use that. And this is, Aperol is a little uh, fruity flavor like orange, fruity flavor, and got just a little hint of bitterness. Or you can use the other liqueur called Campari. And again, it was also invented in Milan. Let me look here when the date was. Uh, it usually says it on the front, but it doesn't say right there. But uh, it's uh, at least 200 years ago. And this Campari, I'm looking at the uh, recipe right on the back. It's, uh, it's a one third Campari, two thirds Prosecco, a little splash of sparkling water served over ice. And it makes a very refreshing drink. The Campari is, also a orange flavored liqueur, but it's got bitters in it as well. So a little, uh, little acidic and bitter to your taste. The other drink, the Aperol, the other liqueur Aperol is a little more sweet and soothing and citrusy as it goes down. I like Campari. So that's what I'm making real quickly. Let me show you how it's done. The ice in a glass. On a bartender. Campari, about one, I just eyeball it, one third Campari. Two thirds Prosecco, which is Italian sparkling wine. Put that down in case anybody else wants some later on. And a little bit of this is sparkling water, a little bit of sparkling water, stir it up and drink it. And it makes for a really good uh, little aperitivo before dinner and while I'm talking to you. Okay, with that said, let me move on here. We're going to um, share my screen here. Thank you, Leslie, for uh, keeping me uh, situated. So this is a map of Rome, the historic city center. And in Rome, uh, you can, it's, it's spread out quite a bit, much more so than uh, some of the smaller cities we visit, like uh, say Volterra or Florence or things like that. But uh, Rome, you can really walk from the far side across the river Tiber. You can walk from St. Peter's Basilica and Vatican you can walk all the way across the river to the Parthenon and Trevi Fountain, so which I call the historic city, Baroque city center. You can walk there in 30 minutes at just a leisurely pace. And then from the Pantheon and Trevi Fountain over to the Colosseum, another little leisurely, leisurely pace of about 30 minutes. So it's a walkable city, 
but there's also put together with a metro line there that connects some of the places and also some uh, city buses. And of course, taxis are very inexpensive as well. So what we're gonna talk about to begin with is going to be the area of town where the Coliseum is. Now, you can see the Coliseum is way down here on this part in the far south uh, east part of Rome. And uh, so let me let this run a second right here in this area. And we'll talk a little bit about the Colosseum here. So many, I know you all have seen images of this Colosseum and it was uh, constructed in 80 AD and it took the Romans and their slaves especially only 10 years to build. So uh, the slaves that they used were the slaves that were imprisoned from the uh, capture of uh, what we know as the Holy Land uh, for the Israeli people, uh, for the Israelite people, who, uh, for the Jews and Hebrews who were carried into slavery uh, when the Romans finally got tired of them uh, in, the, in what we now know as the Holy Land. And they brought about 500,000 back. And those, uh, some of them were used to construct this Colosseum in uh, between the years of 70 to 80 AD. And um, they did a fantastic job. Uh, this is a facade on the outside, about two thirds of it still stands. And I wanted to point out that there's three levels to the Colosseum. And on the first level, you can see their, their Doric columns. Doric is the, um, uh, the Greeks invented these columns, but the Romans basically adopted everything Greek once they conquered, uh, conquered the Greeks in the like 250 um, BC. And uh, so what happened was that uh, they took over their architectural style. And so you see there's, there's Doric columns on the first level. And this whole Colosseum is made from uh, a concrete product which they would lay bricks, two layers of bricks, or two encase two bricks, and then pour a concrete inside these brick walls. And then it was layered with this travertine marble on the outside. So that's what you see here. Uh, the second layer up from the Colosseum is a column called Ionic Columns, and it has a little scroll on the capital of the column. The first one I mentioned, Doric, has no scroll. It's just a flat column going straight up. And then the third level of the Colosseum has the third type of columns called the Corinthian columns, which is uh, plant-like, leaf-like at the top. And as a matter of fact, we were just in Greece recently, and we were in the town of Corinth, Greece. And that is where the Corinthian columns originated in the town of Corinth, because there's a particular type of plant that grows there uh, that they modeled those Corinthian columns after. These are some scenes of the Colosseum modern day. The Colosseum is going under a, 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 about a 25 year renovation. And so the first two phases are done, and that is cleaning the entire outside. And uh, this photo right here that, is, that I'm stopping on uh, was taken before the cleaning began. The previous photo was uh, after the cleaning had uh, been completed on the outside. And then now they've just completed the second phase, which is working on all the underground parts of the Colosseum and having a, uh, the underground cleaned out so people can walk down below the actual arena, the stage of the Colosseum. This is the interior of the Colosseum. I just shot a few weeks ago. And uh, the part of the new construction uh, of the floor, they put in uh, like one third of the floor here. And the plan is to continue to cover the entire floor so that uh, it will resemble what it looked like uh, when the Colosseum was first constructed in 80 AD. The fourth phase is to uh, retrofit in some, some seating and also put sails up over the top or awnings up over the top so that it would be covered just like it was back in the day, being covered and shaded back in the day. And that's another 10 year project.
right here uh, was, gosh, I guess in 2014, I think. And you can see this whole big scaffolding. They were using that and it was on rollers on the bottom and it was progressing around the Coliseum all the way as the cleaning took, took place. So this is, uh, as you know, one of the most widely recognized icons of all of Europe. The Colosseum here. Just one little section of stones, how it, uh, the seats would have been placed. And you can imagine that all the way around, up, 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 up for six levels. So just like today, the cheap seats were in the nosebleed section. <laughs> but uh, everyone was entitled to come in here if they were citizens of Rome. You can look and you'll see over here there's a partial stage, or what would be the floor of the Colosseum built, that you can kind of get an idea of how it would be. And uh, the floor would be covered with sand. Now, the word for sand is arena. So hence we have the name arena for a round stage area. Your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. Uh, the next few scenes of video were um, just filmed, gosh, the middle of, middle of July of this year. And uh, I'm filming here because it's so unusual because the only two people in line with us were these two ladies, uh, or maybe it's a lady and a guy, uh, walking into the, into the Coliseum. There was no queue, no line, no waiting in line. We bought our tickets online the day before, and we just walked right in. And you can see in this next series of photos and videos that uh, it's just so amazing that there's maybe less than, 150 people or so that are in the Coliseum while we're in visiting it as well. So another great reason that travel is, in, uh, now is the time to travel because typically you have to wait in a very, very long queue in the hot sunshine. And I'm talking about up to an hour or so, even if you do have a ticket. So, and then you get inside and it's jam packed as well. So this is an indication that is still a great time to do traveling and uh, go to Rome, even this fall. I think so. I know we did it in 2002. I'm talking to my son, Brian, because uh, we were, he was wondering, he's been to Europe a couple of times. And uh, so he was wondering what year he went. And uh, we were there in 97 with him and in 1997 and in 2002. And I think we went to the Coliseum in 97 as well. I'm looking at Leslie here because she was there too. I want to point out here on the Coliseum on the interior because you can see this really well. You see all these holes that are here in the travertine? Well, they had big slabs of travertine that were put up against the concrete foundation. And these slabs were held in with iron pegs and they were used, number one, to set them in place. So there would be a peg and then just like in a dowel, so it'd be like a dowel. And then it would slide into the hole on the, on the travertine block above it. But it also would hold it to the rocks or to the foundation wall of brick and concrete. Well, what happened in later centuries in the Middle Ages during the Iron Age the um, iron became a very shortage, a shortage, and the people that lived in Rome uh, cannibalized all of the iron in the Colosseum and dug up these bars of, of uh, iron out of the Colosseum and used them for tools and weapons and whatnot. So that's why you see all these holes and pocket marks there. They weren't there originally. And uh, so everybody says, why is there all, all the holes here? That's the reason. Oh, yeah. well, I don't think this is cool. inside. And if you think of this. But, that was just Julia's fake. Wait, I need to do a video on it. Quickly, show the thing. This is my granddaughter, Lillian, like, taking a video for a friend. Show the Coliseum and then sign off. Pop time. Come 
forward, cameraman. Yeah. Did you say cameraman? Yes, I did. Well, I got a new cameraman today, guys. It is very it's new. Still, yeah. <laughs> it's a very it's new. It's normally I'm in the videos, not yeah. the camera. Yeah. This is yeah. It's very sunny. I'm going to give you a tear. Back up, back up, back up, back up. So here's the Coliseum. This is Lily's shirt. Okay, there people need to get up. <laughs> so I don't know what they were trying to do, but she evidently had some agenda. But let me show you where this guy's standing with the yellow scarf is one of the a great example of the brick walls that they would build. They would build a hollow wall, so four sides, and then pour in a mixture of sand, mortar, uh, concrete, and the local stone, which was there, was, um, we call it um, limestone or pumice, volcanic rock is what it was, volcanic rock. And so the Romans, I think, were the first people that invented that invented what we kind of call a concrete. And so they would make a form out of the bricks from that. Over here in luck. Probably way more than you want to know about the architecture. This is a great view. Now, below here, this area down below the stage would be the staging area for all of the. Um, characters who would be participating in the, the games. Now, it's been said that when the, uh, the Colosseum, which it really wasn't called a Colosseum back in the day, it was known as the Flavian Amphitheater. Amphitheater means it's two theaters, two half circles taken and put together to make a two-sided theater amphitheater. And it was called the Flavian Amphitheater because the reigning um, emperors at the time were from the Flavian culture or the Flavian family, let's say that. And so the, the, the way it got the name of Colosseum is, was during the construction of the amphitheater, there was a, just down the road from the Colosseum was a lake and a whole villa um, owned by the previous emperor, Nero. And Nero had a very, very large statue a uh, 35, 40 foot statue made of bronze of himself in his villa, just about 150 yards away from where the Colosseum is now. And so once Nero uh, died and left office, the next emperor came in and uh, Vespavian, I think is who it was. And he came in and he took that colossal statue of Nero and he erected it right outside the Colosseum, or what we know as the Flavian Amphitheater, and it became that colossal statue, became the, uh, the word colossal, became just associated with the Colosseum, and it evolved into that. So the slang for the Flavian Amphitheater. So that's how that gets there. Now you can see uh, down below here is, like I was mentioning before, um, all of the underground works of what would happen, the staging area for all those who were particip participating in the games. And what would happen in the day, back in the day was uh, when the uh, Flavian Amphitheater was first opened in 80 AD, they had 100 days of games. And if you were a Roman citizen, you, had, you were entitled to come to those games free of charge. It was your right to be a part of that. And you would have a little uh, stone uh, or a clay tablet ticket that had a number on it for your seat. It had an entrance gate on it for your entrance gate and the level in which you were uh, going to, just like our modern day, sta our modern day stadiums. And it also had an, uh, uh, an area outside where I was showing you with those pocket marks. So it had those areas where there would be kind of like concession stand set up. <clears throat> and during halftime, which uh, really it was because they'd have games in the morning, a break for lunch, and games in the afternoon and evening. And during halftime, they would be selling um, whatever was slaughtered the first part of the day. So it could be chickens and roosters and rabbits and small little animals, pigs, 
those kind of things would be uh, used to uh, entertain people and uh, hunt, huntsmen and uh, archers and everything would be killing those earlier in the day. They'd be barbecued and sold. And we know this is for sure, really, I'm not just making it up because there are chicken bones and uh, uh, little hibachis and everything that are there on display in display cases that were found during excavation in the Colosseum. Anyway, it's said that when those games were on the, during the first hundred days, there were um, 900, let's say 9,000 animals killed and 250 men, uh, 2,500 men were killed. I got it wrong during uh, the first 100 days of those games. So uh, it was crazy. And the afternoon would progress to be, uh, you know, uh, uh, prisoners and slaves would be pit against uh, bears and uh, elephants and even giraffes, if, believe it or not. And these animals would be, uh, starved and then they would uh, be set up and they would, for example, put a prisoner up there. Uh, there was something about taming, uh, taming a bear by playing music. And so they would put a non-musician slave up there or a prisoner up there and give him a lute and they try to play something and the bear would eat him and uh, that would be entertainment. And then it finally, the, the culmination of the games each day was the gladiators fighting one another. And the gladiators were, uh, could be slaves. You know, you know, you've seen Russell Crowe and all that stuff. So they could be slaves, but they were very well uh, cared for and sought after. And a lot of times uh, the gladiators would not fight to the death, but sometimes they did. And what would happen is they, uh, once so uh, one man was defeating the other and they had him down for the count, uh, the gladiator, the winning gladiator would look up at Caesar and look for, we, we've heard often it's either a thumbs up or a, thumb, a thumbs down, but that's not really what it would do. Caesar would give them either the thumbs up to let the gladiator live or the thumb across the neck to cut his neck and be done with it. So uh, that's kind of how the games proceeded for those first hundred days. And it continued on until uh, the third century AD for almost uh, 400 years. So this thing was in use and I'm talking way too much. Uh, so let me just let it run off here. But notice the lack of tourists. Because it turned you into a church in the Middle Ages. Like in that shot, we see maybe 23 or 4 or 5 people. Yeah, so Cora, uh, your, your message here says, uh, if tourist crowds are going to remain low during the fall. And yes, most definitely. I uh, was just in Ireland with a group of 17 French horn players. And uh, we were the first group everywhere we went. They were so happy to see us. The first group in 18 months. And uh, so there was no crowds in Ireland for anything. And uh, this was shot Cora in July in Rome. So I believe we're going to be good to go as far as uh, wide open tourism uh, all the way through September and October as well. I don't know who that was, that girl is, or why I even have it there. Uh, I do know who this girl is. This is Julia Chapman. She's a friend of mine and a wonderful tour guide. Her home is uh, in Rome right now. She's married to a Roman and has uh, three children there but her roots are from Texas and her father owned a whole ranch in Texas. And she is just a fantastic go-to guy that we use there that does a great job with us in Rome and the Colosseum, the Forum and the Vatican Museum. Okay, I've mentioned the Forum 
And so let me, let me, a little bit on the map here. Let me get this out of the way. The Coliseum is down here in the bottom corner, the bottom uh, right hand corner. And then the Forum is just a short walk away, um, just right across the way. And the Forum is the place where the Roman citizens gathered, the senators met, everything happened there. It was the city center, the hub, the communication center. Um, it was the, the heart of the city. And there were quite a few forums in the area. There was the ancient Roman forum, which we know as being, let's say, in the, um, in the uh, let's say it was from the 300 BC to about 300 AD, but there was also the imperial foreman forum and also the Trajan's forum was all in the same sort of area, but they're just excavated in different different parts of the city. Uh, so what we're looking here is at the Roman Forum. Hey, David McGuffin here inviting you to take a 60 second look into the Roman Forum and the Palatine Hill. This is called the Palatine Hill. It's the hill where all the um, the emperors had their palaces. And so there's successive layers of uh, each emperor's palace higher and higher and higher. But it's one of the seven hills of Rome as well, Palatine Hill. Everything is built upon everything here. The Renaissance facade of this church and the church itself was all built inside this Roman temple. See how high the green door is up there? Mm -hmm. So in the 1400s, that was ground level here. So people walked into that church to worship there. Hey, from high above the Roman Forum on the Palatine Hill, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffins exploring Europe. These are just some video I shot from the Palatine Hill. That huge building there is the Basilica of Constantine. And looking back toward Here's the Colosseum. Here's a Coliseum. Eye view of the Roman Forum. Looking back in the direction of the Colosseum, you see that built back there in 70 AD, the Arch of Titus in the foreground here, panning on down the uh, Via Sacra. The sacred way to come to this massive building here. This is a, a basilica of Constantine, a public space, a part of the courts. Looking on down the same way, the sacred way, we come to another basilica here that uh, has some significance because it was a temple and a church built into it looking on through the forum proper and the final square building down there is the Curia uh, and beyond that the Victoria Emmanuel Monument. So the big white building in the background is not a part of the, the Roman Forum. It is a monument erected in the late 18, 1800s to commemorate um, the first king who united united and unified all of Italy, named uh, Victoria Emmanuel II. And uh, so it's a big monument, huge, huge. Many people call it the wedding cake or a, it resembles a typewriter. But around the front of it is also the tomb of the unknown soldier for all the wars that uh, those in uh, Italy have lost or those in the provinces around Italy. Uh, so the unknown soldiers that, who have been lost there as well. David McGuffin here with a bird's eye tour of the Roman Forum. The Colosseum in the background. There. Uh, maybe you get two videos, two of the same video. So I'll talk over it a little bit. That via, that way, the via sacra, the way I keep talking or mentioning, is the main drag that goes down through the Forum. And um, also, Right below this temple that you see here with the columns is the place of the Vestal Virgins, 
which were very important to the uh, success of Rome and to the sacredness of Rome. And then you can see anything with a dome is basically built in the Renaissance and Baroque era. We will always find street musicians, and I'll put this in here just for entertainment and to give you a chance to have a little bit of a Okay, so our menu tonight is spaghetti and meatballs. You won't find that in Italy at all. You'll find meatballs, which are called polvetti, or polvetto, or polvetto. This is my own uh, meatballs, and uh, I'll share the recipe to see if they get the girl in just a second. But we're going to have to find some uh, boils and pasta and put it all together. Oh, pretty chill, really. Okay, the Pantheon is a bit away. Uh, it's just up a main drag of the city center, Baroque city center of Rome called the Il Corso or the heart of Rome. And the Pantheon is another Roman era. Um, by the way, the Roman Empire, 500 BC to 500 AD is kind of what we, we just nail it into. And uh, so before the Roman Empire, we think about uh, the golden age of Greece and, and all of that. But um, the Roman Empire was those 1,000 years there that straddles uh, the birth of Jesus Christ. And um, so the Pantheon was a temple that was built for all gods, Pantheon for all gods. And it's uh, maybe it takes you to walk from the Colosseum to the Pantheon. If you go at a decent pace, it's like um, 30 minutes, depending on how hot it is. But um, it's not, not that far. And you could stroll and take a break and get a, a spritz or something else. I'm watching my water is boiling back here, which, oh, no, it's my meatballs. That's what's going. That's what's happening there. So they're starting to go, too. So, um Anyway, the Pantheon is a temple for all gods. Let me go ahead and play a little video on that as well. So this is the quintessential view called it from the Piazza de Pantheon. And you can see it's got this classical architectural style on the front with the pediment, the columns, Everything looks like classical Greece, classical Rome, but it also has this dome, which is the only existing dome intact from the Roman Empire. And uh, so scholars from, from centuries and centuries and centuries have studied this dome to find out how in the heck the Romans built this thing. This thing was uh, first built in 43 BC and dedicated to a group of uh, What you see here today was built in, uh, I want to say, 140 AD. So the, the pantheon you see today dates from that time, 140 AD. Those are solid granite columns there. I want the meatballs burn. And let me let me point out those guards. Do so you see those guards and camouflage there? That's just the Italian security force. Yeah, they do have something that looks like Uzis. And they're there for our protection or for the protection of the people that are there, tourists and locals alike, because it, it, you know the presence there wards off any kind of hanky panky going on. 
And they're all over the place and have been ever since I've traveled all over Europe. I remember going into um, the Rome airport in uh, 1977 and those guards were all on a, uh, a second story balcony around the entrance hall, just looking down on you with their machine guns held up. But don't be frightened, it gives me peace of mind. This is the Piazza di Pantheon and a Bernini fountain and an Egyptian obelisk. Here inside, you can see the uh, dome that is coffered all the way up and the oculus, there's a hole in the top and it does rain in it. There's, this is interesting. I found a rooftop bar a few blocks away uh, a few years ago and I was able to go up and actually get a view of the dome of the Pantheon, which I've never seen from above before, but it's pretty dang amazing. If you put a basketball, a huge basketball inside there, the dome all the way to the floor would, uh, it would is perfectly rounded. And so, you know, the, um, the, the Romans were just wonderful architects and designers when it comes to that. I caught the sunlight just right one evening here on here. And this is a shot we took at night and there's five or six cafes around the piazza and they don't have the best food in the world, but you can't, find much better ambiance and a, a view than, than right there, because it's just amazing if you spend uh, even you know, eight or 10 euro on a drink and uh, a few little chicati or, or snacks, then uh, you can sit there and enjoy this view all night long. Uh, the full moon was coming up there too. I think you can see it in the upper, upper right hand corner of this photo. The next place is Piazza Navona. It's uh, only about a 10 minute walk from the Pantheon. And Piazza Navona, at one point in the Roman Empire. Hey, David McGuffin oh, here, still you know. in Rome. Now we're at Piazza Navona. Back in the day in the Roman Empire, in the first century AD, this was a stadium where athletic games were, were put on display. And I think that, um, so over the centuries, the name uh, Avone, which means a stadium of athletic games, was kind of translated and transfigured into Navona. And it's become a Baroque center with this church behind me, it's called uh, St. Agnes in Agony. We have an obelisk and a fountain right here behind me of Bernini, the Fountain of the Four Rivers. And this is a great place for nightlife here in Rome. You can hear maybe in the background a lot of guitar music, uh, singers, uh, artists, caricatures and everything. So it's a great place to come and spend the evening. Now, the problem here is that it's not the cheapest place in town to have a drink or have dinner, but the ambiance is unbelievable. So artists, caricatures, musicians, a beautiful Baroque basilica, an Egyptian obelisk, Bernini's Fountain of Four Rivers. It doesn't get much better than this in the evening in Rome. Hey, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. Some years ago, I took this choir to Rome and they sang in that church I just pointed out. This is 
the Niceville High School Choir from Niceville, Florida, under the direction of Michael Guy. And the young man conducting right now is the student conductor. Okay, so this <laughs> next montage we shot last last month in July, um, and uh, that's my two granddaughters, Lillian and the blonde, and Julia, uh, and the brunette. And we're going to this restaurant. You can't hardly see it, but it's Ristorante Alfredo or Alfredo's restaurant, Alfred's restaurant. And um, I think I explain a lot of it in here, but. Let's just let this roll. I've never been here until with them. Alfredo, have you heard of Alfredo? Anything Roman known, known as Alfredo? Well, this is the only place you can get this pasta in Italy. And we call it what? Pasta Alfredo. There's no such thing as chicken Alfredo. Okay, tonight we've been on this tour in Italy for almost two weeks now. And almost every night, Julia has ordered, she wanted to have Alfredo pasta. And we told her every night, they don't have fettuccine Alfredo in Italy. They don't have fettuccine Alfredo in Italy. But I knew there was one place here in Rome that they had it. So Jules, where are we? Where are we? At Alfredo. At Alfredo's <laughs> restaurant where he makes fettuccine Alfredo. The very first time in 1914. You got it. So now we're they're gonna make it here in front of us and we're gonna try it. You see this this uh, there's uh, um by the way, the gentleman in the background is uh is is Brian's um, wife, Lori's wife's father, uh, Ralph Grindstaff, and on Zoom is covered up, but Doris is over there as well. And uh, they were with us along with the two grandkids and Brian and Lori, Brian, my son, and Lori. And uh, we just had a great time traveling around Italy. But this was our last, uh, next to the last night, I think. Uh, photos of American oh, movie stars all over the place here. And in 1920, we hear that Douglas Fairbanks and his wife, uh, who I can't remember the name right now, Mary Pickford. Mary Pickford. There we go. <laughs> came here, and uh, Mr. Alfredo here fixed, prepared for them uh, this this sauce that he made for his uh, wife earlier, and uh, it became very famous. And they went back home to Hollywood and told all the movie stars to come here, and that's why all these movie stars are all over this place, including. Including this movie star right here. Uh, <laughs> the best movie star. Okay. So here we go. We're going to, we're going to have a make it for us right here. The Manicatura. Julia, I can't see you. Move up on that. There you go. So this is fettuccine pasta. And only cheese. There's no milk, which is kind of what we put in it at home. There certainly is no chicken. And the pasta is not the dried version we have here. It's fresh, homemade, every day. As a matter of fact, Lori, that's my daughter-in-law there in the turquoise shirt, um, she wanted to ask if she could get uh, spaghetti fettuccine. They said, no, 
we are making spaghetti um, with the Alfredo sauce. No, we only make it this one way. You either get it this way or you don't. You don't get it. Uh -huh. Yeah, we just looked that up. Uh -huh. Too much for the time. <laughs> I don't know, they might eat the most. <laughs> we have a very old There you go. <laughs> Lily and I can't see. You. Usually, Lily, can you go sit down, please? Now, go. Very important. Thin and soft. Your fed fettuccine is hard. <laughs> All fettuccine that I get at home is hard. Ah, we can make it on the pasta machine. That's where this work this comes from. Mm. What do y'all think? What do you think, Julia? Give us a comment. I was looking at his phone instead of eating. Yeah. All right, sit on the chair. Lily, what do you think? Then we were pretty dry. Lily, what do you think of the pasta? I haven't tasted it yet. Okay. Okay. So let me give you my my authentic takeaway from this restaurant. It was. The pasta was really good and unique. You don't get anything like that in Italy at all. Um, but you saw all the photos of the American movie stars on there. And so a lot of Americans come there and they expect to pay American price, expect to pay American prices. And also the wait staff expects American tips or more uh, because in Italy, you don't really tip the wait staff because they work and they have a, a job and that's their job is being a waiter. Um, but, you know, I gave them 20% and they act like that was uh, not enough uh, after the whole she bang. But uh, anyway, uh, the food's good. It's just right around the corner from Piazza Navona. So if you got a hankering for uh, fettuccine Alfredo, then that's the only place you can ever get it in Rome. And uh, so I'm glad we did it. I'm glad that uh, I got Julia some fettuccine Alfredo. And uh, so it was a great learning experience for me. And uh, they were very polite and very helpful and uh, very appreciative of us being in there. Trevi Fountain, coming up next. It's a hike from the... Um, from the Piazza Navona, you go back to the Pantheon and then you take a little red brick road all the way down the way down. Okay, so Rome is definitely hopping. It's, uh, gosh, 10.30 <laughs> here. We're just down from the Pantheon. It's Main Street. <clears throat> which I come down all the time. I call it the uh, the brown brick road to the Trevi Fountain. And it's hopping, so uh, tourism's coming back. Still don't hear a whole lot of English from Americans, but more so now after a month of being in Europe than we did early on in June. So right now it's uh, July the 15th, I think. And uh, so we're heading to Trevi Fountain and see what's there. We just had uh, had dinner somewhere I've never had dinner before at uh, the original Alfredo's restaurant. So we had fettuccine Alfredo, which I must say is pretty good. But that's about the only place you can find it in Italy. Anyway, let's see what the Trevi Fountain looks like. Hey, David McGuffin here. Wow, I've been in Rome for three days now and barely shot a photo. My group arrived yesterday and we've been going nonstop seeing all the sights here. But I couldn't leave Rome without uh, shooting at least a little video to let you know what's going on. Of course, I'm standing at the Trevi Fountain here. A lot of people are here on a uh, June night. You can see right here. But it's pretty dang fantastic that um, we're here. Everything's going great. 
16th. Tour is doing good. We've had two full days of traveling around, say, the Vatican Museum. Uh, yesterday, we did the Colosseum and the Roman Forum. We're capping it all off after uh, licking some gelato on the way here and uh, visiting the Trevi Fountain. This is insanely gorgeous. So, is this super old too? No? Only from the 1600s. Oh, only 500 years old? Yeah. Start over. I wish that the insurance will pay us lots of money and they won't ask any questions. I wish everyone gets back to America okay. with negative COVID test tomorrow. You don't know, uh, uh, that was important. It didn't make it. It's right there. On the <laughs> wish for something that can happen. Wish for um. Very with twenty twenty dollars. Behind your shoulder. It goes like this. I wish. Like this. I wish. I don't know what to say. Ciao, David McGuffin here from Rome. My gosh, it's been a hot and sweaty day here. About 90 degrees. We've done a whole lot, but now we're at the Trevi Fountain. And, um, you know, tradition says. If you take a coin, 20 euro cents, and you throw it with your right hand over your left shoulder, it guarantees you to return to Rome. And for me, it works every time. So for you, I hope you'll join me here as well. So that if you throw a coin in, you can come back again. So I'm throwing a coin in for everyone who wants to come to Rome with me and have a great time. We're giving some fantastic discounts on a couple of tours in Italy in the next uh, two or three months. So if you want to join me, so here we go. A coin in the fountain guarantees you'll come back to Rome and I know that'll happen to me. I'll be back here in a couple of weeks, I think. So here we go. <laughs> Your adventure starts here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. Okay, well, I, I hope you enjoyed that. I had a fun time putting it all together. You know, you don't realize how much uh, how much content you have until you start looking through your uh, photo library. And uh, so I'm thankful we had that. Um, so that's my two weeks of Rome, Vatican City, Trastevere neighborhood last week, and then what you saw here tonight. I've got stuff cooking here on the stove. Um, I'm just gonna, I got pasta in the pot, but I just wanted to show you my, uh, my uh, meatballs and my tomato sauce. All of this is uh, my stuff and we're gonna combine it all together. And I think you heard me mention the Italian word manicatura when uh, the gentleman was mixing the uh, Alfredo pasta uh, with the sauce and the cheese. And that just means mana is hands, mano is hands. So just doing it by hand, mixing it all together. And so we're gonna let our uh, spaghetti noodles boil and finish up, put them in there. And then that's our dinner tonight. We're having uh, for dinner a Chianti Classico wine. Uh, notice again, just like last week, it's a Kirkland brand. So if you go to Costco, they've got some pretty good wine there that is authentic from Italy and uh, it tastes great and the price is right. So. Maybe Costco will pick me up as a sponsor. I don't know. <laughs> Who knows? But anyway, that's it. Um, we've got tours in Italy coming up in September, beginning in the middle of September. I think the, I want to say the uh, 13th or 17th, we've got a villa tour coming up. And then uh, later on in the month, around on the 23rd or so, we have the best of Italy and essence of Italy. And there are spots available. If you're interested in going, just get in touch with me. We'll talk about it. And I'd love to have you join us. And uh, next week, I'm talking about the little town of Volterra. And uh, we were there in Ju July as well. So that's what we're going to be talking about. And that's where our Villa Tour is. And also our best of Italy tour, in essence, the Italy tour goes through there. So we'll visit with my friends who live there in Volterra. Okay, 
So that's it for the night. Thank you for joining me on Travel Talk Tuesday, and we'll catch you next week. See you later. Ciao. Arrivederci.